Well, welcome on board, everybody, and thank you for joining us today. The online event, a guide to structural waterproofing compliance. Very glad to have you all with us. And just to run through a couple of housekeeping items before we chip into it. Today, our speakers, uh, Hayden Prestige from Markham, is uh, usually based in New Zealand. He's joining us today from the uh, Sydney office. We have Clive Tuffin, who's joining us from the United Kingdom. He's from Premcrete Limited. And David Previty, who's joining us from Australia of Waterproofing Integrity. The speakers will each give us a couple of lines about themselves as they join the conversation. And we'll share information about each of the companies at the end of the presentation. Just to run very quickly through the main points of the agenda, we've got an opening overview uh, Clive Tuffin will give us deeper understanding on British Standard 8102, 2022 and subgrade waterproofing. David Previty will give us the connection between British Standard 8102 and Australian NCC 2025. We'll talk about the importance of early engagement and the pathway to compliance. We'll have a little bit of a background about each of the companies who are represented today and a live question and answer forum which you are very welcome to take part. You can submit your questions at any time using the Q&A button at the bottom of the window. Before we go any further, we're just going to do a very quick poll. If you'd be so good as to share with us uh, what your job role is, which will give us a bit of a picture of who we've got on board with us. I'm just uh, cranking that up now. Does everybody see that? If you click on the polls button at the bottom, if you can't already see it. I'll just run that for about 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Gives us a little bit of a, a feel for what your main interests are and how we can best help you. Without further ado, we'd like to lead into this. If Hayden, if you could take us away, please. Brilliant, thanks, Brendan, and welcome. Good morning, good evening. <clears throat> We've got a bunch of um, people joining from all over actually so it's great to have you all on board it's definitely proves it's a topic of interest um, waterproofing in general as we know is a um, is a has been a hard thing to get right I should say if we can get it right but um, so that makes it a topic but it's a very expensive thing to um, when it goes wrong so as we also know so it's awesome to have this interest on here and um, everyone looking to be um, you know, upskilled further and develop. So thanks for joining. So yeah, as Brendan said, I'm Hayden Prestige, work with Markham. <clears throat> I came out of the construction industry. So I uh, used to swing a hammer up and now um, been with Markham for nine years and work with the Australia and New Zealand sales and marketing team. So that's me in a, a nutshell. Um, and why we, why we've pulled this together is really we're really focusing in on subgrade waterproofing um, we know it's a big topic it's a topic that needs to be discussed and we need each other's help to get it right so hence the um, this platform to try and bring that together the i guess as we know australia and new zealand do not have a standard or a code as such for subgrade waterproofing uh, which is always amusing because it's such a such an area of um, risk as we know but what that's led to is the adoption of the british standard bs8102 um you know as a guide 
to get things right and subgrade waterproofing. So during this presentation, we're just focusing in on uh, basements and subgrade. Obviously, there's many other aspects of waterproofing as we go. And then, um, you know, there's the British standard, but then how does that, uh, how does that, what's the connection between the Australian and New Zealand um, codes and the National Construction Code in Australia? So hence why we're bringing this together. So just moving forward, <clears throat> um, I'd like to introduce Clive. Uh, so Markham has partnered with Premcrete in the UK. Uh, they've been doing basement waterproofing, manufacturing and installing of systems for um, a long period of time, predominantly based in the London market. So Clive, I was hoping you can dive into the British standard and help us understand more from your experience. Very good. Thanks, Hayden. I trust everyone's hearing me okay. Um, glad to be on this webinar with you all. Um, so just a, a brief um, piece of background, I guess. Hayden's rightly mentioned, we've been in the, the basement waterproofing market um, for, for many years. Indeed, I guess the UK, predominantly London, has um, had a significant growth in the basement market over the past 10 to 15 years, um, which like many of the other um, significant global manufacturers, we've played a really key part in in um, a significant percentage of the schemes across London, but indeed throughout the UK. So yeah, glad to be on board today. Um, it's going to be a relatively um, brief snapshot overview in terms of the key principles of BS8102. And um, hopefully it gives some sort of core background to the design principles. So if we go on to the, the next slide. So I thought we'd just kick off um, the background to BS8102, the latest edition of 2022. There were some significant updates um, since the previous 2009 edition. Now, the significance of the updates have been very much geared towards those of us in the market who are designers. Um, now, one of the key elements is it's really clarified the scope um, and the responsibilities of proofing designers, um, but it's also pointed up and highlighted the importance of early stage involvement um, with specialist designers. Um, so I am well aware, having been to the the recent event in Sydney, um, which David hosted and arranged, um, where there's a lot of discussion around the new NCC standards. And it was interesting to network with many others in the Australia market. And I, I see there's um, some great opportunity for development throughout the industry, learning together through earlier collaboration um, with all different stakeholders. So this is very much what's been pointed up in BS8102. Um, so it specifically mentions about the appointment of a waterproofing specialist at what's called an early reverse stage. Now I know this isn't, isn't entirely appropriate to the Australian stages of design, but essentially it's the preliminary stages of establishing a, a structural design, architectural design of a project. Also on the 2022 edition of BS8102, it's been um, significantly highlighting the need to design um, with the consequences of defects in mind. And we'll go into that in a bit more detail shortly. So there's been a lot of focus around the considerations of what the internal construction will be, the final usage of the environments within inside the basement, and therefore, what impact that might have on the possibilities or maybe the challenges of actual remediation um, at, at a later date, should there be issues. So it's really important that we're designing with the, the end in mind um, and considering should an issue arise, how will that be resolved? Um, there's also key considerations around follow on trades, um, making sure that we are mitigating damages 
being prepared for what might follow on um, by, let's say, the internal fit out and how that might interact with key waterproofing interfaces. There's also been some clarity around podium decks, which is obviously the, the ultimate um, sealing up of a basement, the basement lid, if you like. Um, so the, the slab at ground level over the top of your basement, we used to design um, and have products that were certified for zero fall applications. 2022 updates of BS8102 have now highlighted the importance of 1 to 80 falls, which I know is also being um, discussed in relation to the NCC updates coming through as well. Movement joints, um, I guess none of us in the waterproofing trade are, are great fans of movement joints. They can unfortunately cause um, the challenge, challenges we don't want to be seeing, um, mainly due to the fact that they can be very challenging to detail right and well on site. So again, BS8102 does highlight the need to um, only use these in an instance that they're absolutely unavoidable from a structural design perspective. There's also a key definition um, which has been clarified in the 2022 updates in terms of dampness. And we'll go into the grades of environment in a moment. Um, but dampness in accordance with BS8102 is no longer an area that is physically wet, but it's more specifically an area that is slightly wet resulting from the internal environment. In other words, this is not dampness passing through the structure. So as far as BS8102 is concerned, dampness is, is a, um, a state that can be created within a basement, but is only as a result of the internal environment, i.e. a lack of ventilation. So it's been a really key term because historically we designed many basements to allow what we call dampness um, as penetrating from the outside to in. Um, so if we go on to the next slide, please. So in terms of key considerations for design, um, there's many things we need to be considering. Um, and I'll talk through um, in a moment the kind of pathway that design takes. One of the key elements of BS8102 is considering the maintainability. Now, this may be, as a second point there mentions, land drains and other similar external drainage outside of the basement. They can be maintained. But we also need to be considering for the lifetime of a structure, if there is a defect, how can that be addressed? How can we maintain the water tightness of the structure? In the instance that we've got a, um, a habitable basement, so a dry environment we need to achieve, internal finishes are being installed. It's a really key consideration to make sure that we're incorporating combined waterproofing protection. Two forms of waterproofing, and we'll go through this in a moment, is the way in which we can design in accordance with BS8102. And I know prim primarily in the Australian market, this would be generally speaking in the form of a, an external pre-applied bonded membrane in conjunction with a, a watertight concrete additive, for example. Buildability is a really key consideration highlighted throughout BS8102. And I guess that's where collaborating, working with designers who have experience, hands-on experience um, in terms of understanding how structures actually get built, the follow-on sequence of trades and the impact that may have on waterproofing. Really, really key that we're understanding that early on. Shockcrete, um, which I know is widely used in the Australian market. Um, indeed, it was used for many years in a significant way in the UK. Um, however, due to many issues mainly based on concrete compaction um, that very much is being discouraged because we all know that the success of any waterproofing system is dependent um, significantly on good quality compacted concrete precast concrete design so precast retaining walls and the like um, this is a a great op op option if there is the opportunity for it within a basement. But again, there's some really key considerations that we must all bear in mind around the detailing of the construction joints 
and how we'll maintain the integrity at these critical areas. Protection of the waterproofing systems that are being installed. So it may be an external membrane being installed um, around a basement. We're going to be backfilling against the walls. It's really important that suitable protection elements are incorporated. And again, a significant focus on that in the latest edition of BS8102. The last couple of pieces relate to the overall structure's design life. Um, primarily, there's the crack width design, which depending on whether you're looking at a water site concrete additive um, or whether you're looking at a membrane system, it's really key that at an early stage, there's collaboration with the waterproofing designer. It may be that there's a, for example, a 0.2 millimeter or a 0.3 millimeter crack width design required. Knowledge of this in the context of waterproofing is so important. And the earlier that's built into the considerations, the better to save any excessive over redesign of the structural detailing at a later date. And lastly, a structure's design life. It's really important that systems that are incorporated within basement design have a design life appropriate to that to which the structure is, which they're going to be incorporated. So just a key consideration when looking at an early stage around which systems. Next slide, please. So just to cover off quickly in terms of the grades of waterproofing environment, um, and I do know that this is becoming increasingly um, familiar terminology in the Australian market, um, but there is grade 1A. This is the lowest form of waterproofing, and indeed, water seepage is tolerable to this grade of environment. Um, so what I know is regularly referred to as a wet wall basement. Um, indeed, I know that's also being discouraged, and I'm sure David will go into that in a bit more detail in due course. We don't really see basements being designed as new build as a grade 1A um, in Britain. We tend to start a grade 1B. This is no seepage or water ingress, but there could be some mar marginal dampness that would be present through, let's say, some capillary traction of moisture um, from the outside to in. But this is what's classed as a grade 1B. Grade 2, this is no seepage and no dampness is acceptable passing through the structure. There could, however, be some dampness within the internal environment due to a lack of condensation, sorry, due to a lack of ventilation and therefore causing condensation. So a typical example might be a, a plant room. It could be a, a lift pit, lift core within a structure. And lastly, we have what's the habitable environment, the grade three structures. Um, and it's important to note a normal design consideration for us would be if we have a grade two or a grade three basement, then we'd be considering combined waterproofing protection in the form of two independent systems. Next slide, please. So at the outset of every scheme, it's very important that firstly, we understand the grade of environment that we must achieve. I often say to designers, specifiers, at the outset of a scheme, start with the end in mind. What is the end game? What does the client expect from this structure? And we can then develop the design um, following that. And the design all starts with choosing the type of waterproofing. In accordance with BS8102, there's three types, type A, B, and C. Type A is what's classified as barrier protection. Essentially, this is a range of bonded membranes. It could be a pre-applied um, waterproof membrane um, that will actually physically bond to the wet concrete. It could be a liquid applied membrane solution. It could be a self-adhesive post-applied membrane. Um, all of these types of systems are classified as a type A waterproofing system. Type B, this is integral protection. So it comes, what we generally know, in the form of waterproof concrete additives, um, which Hayden, I know, will probably touch on that a little bit later on. Um, there's a variety of technologies on the market, um, but essentially they're all classified as type B. Also important to note that BS8102 does accept um, secant pile wall structure as a type B for defense. And it does also consider welded sheet piles as being acceptable as this type of 
waterproofing also. So there is opportunity to incorporate elements outside of a specific waterproofing product per se within the overall waterproofing strategy, so long as the warranty requirements meet what the client's looking for. And lastly, we have type C, this is a water management system. So cavity drainage um, systems, whether it be external or internal. Next slide, please. So just to quickly cover in terms of combined waterproofing, there was indeed a, a, um, a case that went through the courts in the late 1990s, where a subcontractor was responsible to install a waterproofing system that had been designed by a main contractor. In brief, there was defects. There was failure in the system and the subcontractor was owed money um, from the main contractor due to the fact that the main contractor was unwilling to pay for essentially failed waterproofing. In brief, the judge determined that it was unreasonable and unrealistic to expect a bonded sheet membrane to be installed without a defect. Now this here was the first um, court case which set a precedent indicating the need to be considering combined protection. Essentially, pointing to the fact that we can't reckon on products that will be installed by humans to be installed without a defect. And if a completely dry environment is required, then combined protection should be considered. Next slide, please. So to cover off quickly in relation to where design essentially starts in relation to BS 8102. There is a table one within the standard, which largely is what influences our consideration as a designer in terms of when combined protection is needed and when a single form of waterproofing may be acceptable. So on the left, we start off with the risk. Now this is the risk of the structure we're building. A high risk structure would be a, let's say, a a multi-level basement of a, of a residential high-end development. A low-risk basement would be a single-storey basement car park, for example. We then have the water table, which will vary from site to site. And then we have the type A, type B and type C waterproofing systems incorporated for consideration. Now, as you can see, as the level of the risk increases, and likewise, if there is an increasing risk of water table, Table one highlights the importance to be considering combined protection, um, it, whether it be the form of a, a type A membrane in conjunction with a, a piled wall or a, a liner concrete wall designed in accordance with the appropriate standards to ma manage crack control. All of these are really key considerations at an early stage. There is also many other guidance documents that we would follow, in particular the property care association who provides the cssw qualifications they outline specifically in a lot more detail some key considerations when looking at combined waterproofing next slide please so we just thought we'd cover off on a few key design milestones every project should follow as strict a design process as possible to ensure that the waterproofing design incorporation doesn't make a major impact in terms of the overall design process. Now, every project kicks off with the initial design concepts, followed through by the sort of outline structural design considerations, understanding what the client's looking for. However, at this very early stage, it is possible to establish a high level, albeit high level at this stage, design strategy. So the appointment of a waterproofing specialist, somebody can take on the design liability, collaborate with the design team, is really key for the overall success. It's our responsibility as a designer to then carry out initial desk studies. Um, so understanding the characteristics of the site, characteristics in the ground in relation to water table risk, etc., and therefore building in a risk assessed design, which is incorporating the appropriate types of waterproofing. And ultimately producing detailed drawings project specific to each project. Next slide, please. So finally, just to cover off in terms of independent accreditation and the warranties, what's really important in terms of design of basements, and we know that we're on a journey, um, the Australian market is on a journey and on a mission to raise the bar, raise the level um, with a view to keeping water out of our basements. 
But what's really key with engaging with designers and ensuring there's appropriate levels of professional indemnity insurance. Um, as a company, we do, um, as working in collaboration with, with Markham, we provide 10 million PI insurance. A CSSW design, so a certified surveyor of structural waterproofing, is absolutely key in accordance with BS8102 that somebody suitably competent and qualified is responsible for design. 25 year system warranties for installed products indeed is very much a, a standard offering um, across across schemes that we work on. Agreement certification is really key, making sure there's third party accreditation for core system products. So that's a, gone through the scrutiny for their independent application. Compliance with European harmonized standards, etc., still has a place today and is important. And manufacturers should be able to demonstrate ISO um, accreditation. So 9001 for quality control, 14001 for environmental practices, all what's really key in today's environment of design. And lastly, if there's opportunity for carbon neutral accreditation, um, collaborating with manufacturers um, that have such accreditations will, will only help clients with what they may be needing to achieve for their carbon goals and missions. So I think that might bring my piece to a close, does it, Brendan? Brilliant, thanks, um, Clive. <clears throat> Appreciate that. A lot of in-depth knowledge and quite a passionate topic for you, as we can see. But yeah, the, the um, obviously working alongside that, that uh, standard for X number of years now um, has, has, has Proven so has, has raised a lot of th um, thought process with me and and talking points, but no doubt with the audience as well. So if you have got questions um, on that, just just a reminder to pop it in the chat, and we will have a Q and A at the, the um, back end of this, just to make sure we cover off everyone's thoughts and uh, questions to get sorted. But okay, so that's the British standard, and that's what's set across in the UK. As, as we said at the start, you know, we're adopting. But now, what does that mean for us on this side of the ditch? And David, take us away. Good morning, everyone. How are you doing? Um, that was great, Clive. Thanks for sharing that. Uh, I'm going to talk about something a little bit different, like uh, Brendan said. It's a little bit more about our regulations here that we can expect to be coming in the future and what that means for us and how we interact with BS8102. So I've got a few slides to get through. So Brendan, I'm just going to say next when we go on to the next one and we can flow through. So cool. Title slide here. NCC, which is our National Construction Code Waterproofing Drafted Changes. So public comment has just finished on this one. Um, next, please, Brendan. Public comments just finished. So now we're going to see what comments get adopted um, and there'll be another iteration come out before it comes into effect probably sometime next year. A uh, little bit about me. I've been in construction waterproofing my entire professional career from everything from installation to quality to project management to contracts and more recently for the last five years i'm the founder of waterproofing integrity and we do day in day out waterproofing design and compliance of that design during construction um, next okay so like i just said we're currently just finished uh last week the public comment draft period so we're waiting to see what comes out there that uh, slides a little bit outdated because it's no longer live it's been closed and yeah, that's it for now. Next. Okay, so what does this mean for us? It means that we're gonna have some new rules coming in next about what we must now do for our basement waterproofing design. There is above ground changes as well, but for the sake of this specific focus, we're gonna be looking at uh, below ground structure only. I'm sure we can cover the above ground structure in the future. And what I'm gonna do is talk through the changes at the different levels. So we're gonna start at the top of this triangle, which is our NCC hierarchy here, the objectives, and then we're gonna have a look at functional statements. Then more importantly, we're gonna hit performance requirements. And finally, we'll get down to the bottom. So if we go to the next slide here, we'll 
start with our objectives. So you can see the way that this is marked up here to show the changes that have been made. So our first point here is that we're adding in that we wanted to protect the building and also its internal surfaces from damage caused by entry of water. So it's actually been simplified quite a bit. Everything in red there has been struck off now. Um, there's no delineation between all these different types of H2O. It's just um, any damage caused by the entry of water. And then point B, and this is quite an interesting one, I'll talk about this for a moment, is protect other property from damage caused by redirected, not surface water, just water. So previously this was relevant to if you build a site and you redirect the flow of water from the rain um, into another property, that would be considered a problem. But now it's all sorts of water, which also implies our below ground water. And I'll talk about this just for briefly so I don't take up too much time today. If we go to the next slide to uh, tie back in um, our, our uh, UK origins of BS8102, we currently already have minimum requirements for groundwater investigations and reporting, but that'll take on a new form. Next, please. When we start tying in below groundwater, and I use the phenomenon of uh, iceberg homes that are very common now in the UK, where you have a small bit of um, structure on the top and then a large bit of structure down the bottom, which can disrupt our, our aquifers. So now we're effectively needing to consider the way that the structures below ground might actually disrupt the flow of water and create increased hydrostatic pressure on adjacent properties or something to that effect. Um, whether there will actually be a big uh, issue to resolve around that is, is to be seen from some of the reports that we're seeing or that I've read um, from the UK, which next slide, please which this is one, it's sort of found that there has been monitoring of it to see what the impacts are, and it hasn't found to be uh, that significant, but it's something to consider nonetheless. Next. It's just another one here about the investigating and reporting um, how groundwater factors impact basement designs. Next. Okay. So that's just a bit of a side note, something we can look forward to here as, a, as an ancillary consideration, um, but we'll deal with that when it comes into effect. So now we go down a level in the NCC and we're looking at our functional statements. And you can see again here, we've got some rewording that's happening. We've cut out redirected surface. So it's just water, adverse effects of water, um, including water that may enter the building and damage internal surfaces. So that's point number one. Functional point number two is resistance to, they've actually cut out rain and surface water here. So that point number two is really focused on rising damp and groundwater. So you can see there's a lot more emphasis here where it's above ground and then also below ground. Next. Cool. Now we get into the real meat of it, which is our performance requirements. Next. Okay, and I'll start just with a structural thing. You can see that on the left-hand side here, in the last NCCC, we had five different performance requirements. That's actually been simplified down into just two now. Next. Cool. And those two are effectively F1, P1. So performance requirement number one is managing rainwater, which is our above ground. And then P2 is the managing of groundwater. Next. One more. Okay, that's it. So the actual clause is rising damp and groundwater. That's the, or the title of the performance requirement, just showing a bit of a zoomed in slide here for emphasis. Next. Okay, now what's important is that, and this was a big thing um, in Australia, is that Previously, class seven and eight buildings were exempt from complying with waterproofing performance requirements, or that's a simplistic way of putting it. But at the end of the day, there was a clause in there that was used as a reason why car parks and, and similar had no 
need for waterproofing and they weren't even required to justify how they performed in any way, um, which was always a bit of a problem, right? And, and we'll show you why in a, in a little bit with a video of some bad outcomes that definitely wouldn't be considered compliant. So this exemption has been removed. So now there is a degree of scrutiny that will be applied to, to car parks in these areas to make sure that it's fit for purpose and we're not having any bad outcomes. Next. Okay, so this is just a little bit of a video here that I happened to take yesterday. This is a switchboard of a building and what you're seeing in the background there is actually a shoring wall with a capping beam. That little awning with the black on it is actually mold that's protecting this switchboard from being dripped on barely. Um, so yeah, we effectively have a switchboard mounted to an internal wall here, which is not obviously not a good thing. Um, but these things, you know, were allowed to happen without having a NCC that actually backed up the necessity of having a good design or at least a design that considers whether these things are okay. So that's a good change. And we'll just go to the next slide here as well, which is really some more not so great um, basement outcomes here. And this will just run through quickly, but this was a, a class seven basement for the majority, which was previously exempt. Um, and there was a range of reasons why this sort of happened. The, the design was flawed. The installation was rushed, but effectively it, it resulted in this, which just isn't suitable even for a car park, right? No one would, I think, try to argue that amenity of a space is maintained when you have to walk through water to get to your car or to access plant or a storage location or anything. And most, but not all of these photos are all from one particular project. The ones at the end here, uh, just from a couple of others that I thought were interesting as well. Next, please. Okay, so now we've established our performance requirements being the outcome we need to, to achieve, which effectively is not to allow water to enter the basement in a way that would impact the amenity negatively, um, damage interior finishes, or to damage the structure. <clears throat> And how we're going to prove that we've satisfied those performance requirements, well, there's actually two pathways under the NCC, um, to put it simply. There's DIM to satisfy in this performance solution. Well, unfortunately, at the moment, we do not have a DIM to satisfy provision that is adopted by the NCC. Uh, there is no below ground structure that the NCC, um, sorry, no below ground standard for the waterproofing of below ground structures that the NCC has adopted. So that means currently our only option is a performance solution. And I know this might sound a little bit contrary what, um, to what Clive was saying around BS8102. The way BS8102 is actually used is as a, uh, a system or a process or a code of practice as the title states, as a way of going about getting a performance-based design outcome. So the basics of doing performance-based design is establishing the outcome that you need to get to satisfy the performance requirement, no damage of finishes, no loss of amenity, no damage to the structure. And then you look at your risks, what's our groundwater like, and then we put mitigation in place. And that's pretty much how you go about this in order to create a performance solution. So I hope that's making sense that while BS8102 is from British standards and it is actually noted as a British British standard document, it's not considered that in Australia, but it is very good uh, support for your performance solution. Next, please. Okay, <laughs> so what does this mean for us in the future? It means that we're just gonna have to do things a little bit differently. We're gonna have to prove that we've done a good job rather than just not thinking about it like a lot of projects do. Next. And like I just sort of explained here, we do have these multiple pathways. On the left-hand side is a deem to satisfy provision. I'm sure there will be one developed. Likely uh, a variant of BS8102 will be adopted as a DTS provision in the future. It's just not being done right now. So that means we've got the other pathway, which is a performance solution, like we said. And I've just got one more slide here, which shows a little bit more about that process. Next. Okay, and this is it here. This is just another diagram that I thought was really cool, showing the two different pathways, deemed to satisfy on the right, performance solution on the left, and the, the combination of things that you can use to develop um, 
and justify that solution in order to demonstrate compliance. So that's effectively what we're looking at for the next iteration of the NCC for any below ground structures, including uh, car parks or similar areas, which have been exempt or been able to be overlooked in the past. Next. Oh, and this is just a, a little demonstration here of that sort of design. We've effectively got, if you look at this in columns, three different structural possibilities here. It's a little bit hard to see, but I'll explain it. The one on the left is a fully tanked system. The one on the in the middle there is a drained cavity system, so it is contained. And then the one on the right is a drain system, but it's exposed, so you might see a bit of wetness on the wall and whatnot. Now, these are all very different but that doesn't mean they're not able to achieve an appropriate level of performance, depending on what you're intending to use the space for. So just a little bit of performance-based insight there. Next. And that's me. Thanks for having me on today, guys. I'll pass it back to you. Brilliant, thanks, David. Appreciate that. <clears throat> Brilliant intel. Um, as we can see, a wealth of knowledge. So I would back anyone that's got questions to reach out to David, um, as I have done a number of times. Um, and again, all the listeners, just use that questions uh, box. It's just down the bottom right of your screen there. You see a little question mark and questions, pop anything in there. But I think that's really good what you said, David, about, um, you know, you've got to get to that result of what the project needs. And every project's uh, unique and specific to its conditions and what what the structure is. So using the British um, standard as a guide to get to that point where you can write the performance solution, you know, to ties it all together. So that's really good. So I just wanted to have a look now, um, just on the next slide, I just wanted to touch base because both speakers have mentioned this so far, but really pulling that together and that early engagement is a big key to or big milestone so to speak to the key to success in this um, in compliance and project success so if we just have a quick look let's run through a brief um, diagram process that we put together but then i'd also like any thoughts from yourself david and, and clive so early engagement it starts right at the top think about the job think about what's as, as clive said begin with the end in mind you know, what, what's what's this building doing? What's its life? What's its intended purpose? Who's going to the basement? Those sort of things. What's it holding? And then start the design consideration um, accordingly. So it may pay to bring in some parties there to flesh that out or, you know, to build a checklist of what, you know, make sure we're thinking about the right things at the start. Then think about the um, planned approach with stakeholders so that design considerations how is it best to reach that um, result? And then site evaluation, extremely important is, is you know, what, what's the site? What's the conditions? Is it a brownfield site? Has it got contamination? What's the water levels? All these things. Um, and, you know, the stability of the the um, earth below subgrade, et cetera. You know, all those sort of things come into it. And then review the structure. So what type of structure, what type of um, design? will support the waterproofing that we need and the structure that we need, you know, start thinking about that. Is it a pile? Is it a secant pile? Is it, um, you know, D-wall, these sort of things. And then obviously we need to engage with a waterproofing consultant, um, such as someone like um, David's team, and, you know, to run those risk profiles and grade, you know, and do up a performance um, of what's required in there. And then also with that, engage a waterproofing installation company at that point. So you can start thinking, they've got different methodologies, um, different ways of adding value or um, reducing costs, reduce, you know, better methodologies. Engage early as, as a key step there. Um, again, have the waterproofing teams, consultants to review um, design proposals, you know, make sure it's suitable for that job and then um, you know, get the design sorted. Obviously, it goes to head contractor, make sure we're fully involved all the way through. But then I just wanted to make this point. Don't leave it to the last minute to get your 
um, contractor on board to carry out the waterproofing. There's there's lead times on products. There's training to do. There's um, you know there's a lot of discussion and um, meetings methodology meetings prior. So we want to make sure that's a big part of key to success. And then full project team meetings. Get everyone on board. The concrete companies. You know the um, the head contractors, the waterproofing teams, the consultants, get everyone around the table. This is what we're doing. This is how we're going to control it. It's a, it's a good key step. And then on-site training is very important. You know, who's going to be installing it? Um, you know, are they certified? Have they had some training? Is that ticked off? Have we got certificates, etc.? All key steps. Um, and then construction monitoring as we go through the job. Who's controlling it? Who's uh, QAing it? Who's coming to site as a project management and construction monitoring of the of the um, waterproofing install and then obviously completion sign off compliance so we'll, we'll send out this bit of a checklist you know just so you can think about it as well um, but any comments on that David or Clive interested in any other points or considerations um, yeah I would just add something I, I think this is a really good workflow and it covers a lot of good uh, things that need to be done and considered um, the one thing which I think is important is to not think of it as far as engaging your design stakeholders that, okay, we're, like see how it says review of structure there? That doesn't sort of necessarily mean you do the structural design first and then you bring your waterproofing designer in a couple of steps after the fact. We face this on at least half of our projects where we get engaged a little bit too late and the structure's already locked in and it's less than ideal and it's cut out about 60% of their possible waterproofing solutions and therefore they're not getting optimal value for money and, and whatnot. So we always say to our clients, there is no such thing as too soon for us to get involved. We will you know, give little bits of advice based on the appropriate stage of the project um, and it is a collaborative effort. So yeah, that's the one thing I would say is get your waterproofing specialist involved early oh and just one more thing as well is there needs to be a what would you say like a, a chaperone or someone that's actually guiding the bs8102 process out of the team and honestly the waterproofing consultant is the one that is going to know this inside and out this standard which is effectively a collaboration code of practice in my in my understanding and so having someone that sort of says okay guys here's how we're going to do it we've got to do this desktop study here and here's how we're going to work together um, that's how we sort of normally approach it and it really helps hold everyone together and make sure the appropriate considerations are being had at the right times of the design staging yeah, 100% are back there. That, that review of structures, 100%. That's so often we get involved with the job. You know, we've got this, we're starting in two months. What can we do to waterproof it? And okay, we see what's happening there. But yeah, if we had more engagement early, then you have that input and to get it right. So that valid and 100% a almost like a cheerleader to hold it all together, push the passion, push the motivation right through to completion. So that's good. Anything? else Claude that you think of <clears throat> no I would echo what David says it's um from our perspective in the UK there is a, a sort of further shift in terms of legislative requirements around design processes now um, which is forcing designers to be formally engaged much earlier to just meet building control requirements we're seeing the benefits now where the industry is taking a shift to not leaving it to the last minute to start discussing with waterproofing uh, manufacturers, bringing that in early. And in one sense, um, with with designers, it's important to be aware that there's not necessarily at an early stage always the opportunity to formally engage necessarily. If there is, all well and good. Um, but high level advice, willingness to collaborate at an early stage just to help get the, you might say the show on the road in terms of a waterproofing strategy. And then as maybe the contractual pieces develop more formally, that's when maybe the, the more formal appointment of waterproofing designers, manufacturers might come into play. Um, but we often find that there can be reticence from clients to actually come and approach a waterproofing designer or a manufacturer early, because they're not in a position to be in a contract with anyone. 
but it's important especially as the market's taking a shift like we're seeing in in australia that there's a willingness to collaborate um early is i guess where i'm coming from yeah i think that's good that um just just catching on to the bit you said about it's not necessarily a formal award and i think we need to think about that more as a team it's a team effort to think about the right aspects think about it from different angles everyone's comes to a project from a different angle, a contractor to a consultant to an engineer to a waterproofing specialist, you will think about different components and to get the heads together at that point um, and just think about the project success. That's no, good. Appreciate that input. Right, if we jump to the next slide. Thanks everybody for um, joining us again. I just wanted to briefly touch Based on these companies, obviously, uh, we've got Prem Creek from the UK and then Waterproof and Integrity. But I just want maybe just a couple of words on who you are, what's your strengths, you know, where you come from, those sort of things, just so it gives the intel and um, the company um, audience can reach out if, if, you know, got questions or f further follow up to do. So, Clive, do you want to kick us off there? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Hayden. So, um, yeah, just a bit more breadth and depth, I guess, as to Premcrete as a company. So we've been established since the late 1980s. Um, the company has evolved a lot over the last um, 15 years um, through initially having a, a significant focus on construction chemicals, so structural grouts, concrete repair products, joint sealing systems, as well as waterproofing, um, gas proofing, contamination, resistant membranes, etc. But as a company, we've purely focused on the, um, the waterproofing sector and um, contaminated site protection and the like over the last 10 to 15 years. Um, we've been on a real journey as a, as a manufacturer. Um, initially, we did a lot of outsourced manufacturing um, to our own specifications. We've now brought that in-house. Um, so we are truly a British manufacturer. Um, nothing is being produced in the likes of Eastern Europe or Asia. Um, everything is produced within our within our key manufacturing facility in the south of England. Um, and we very much developed our business um, in the UK. Bearing in mind there's lots of major global manufacturers um, that you would be all well familiar with in the waterproofing sector. We've developed significantly because of our ability to take on design liability, um, taking on the requirement for project specific detailing where required. Um, and ultimately, as I see that piece playing out in the Australian market, there's the likes of waterproofing integrity, where there's a necessity for projects to have that overseeing oversight in terms of the overall strategy. But I do see a real gap in the market currently where somebody could be coming in as a manufacturer and providing a lot more detail around the specifics of design, um, which is where we, I guess, our core strength has come from. Um, so, yeah, I don't know if that gives a, enough background. Um, myself, I've been at the forefront of many of our major projects over the last seven to eight years. Um, I've progressed through the, the business, um, came straight from college into the business in 2012. And today I'm, I'm heading up our... Uh, business development and and technical team. Um, I'm one of the CSSW qualified designers, and from a, an Australian standpoint, Australian market, I'm going to be the one working closely alongside of Markham um, on this exciting venture. So, no, thanks, Scott. It. Good, good overview. Um, yeah, we we partnered up probably it's really only within the last twelve months. So. Got the first shipment of product coming across the water, and um, but it's been a bit a lot of back and forth around design, and and we're off to. So appreciate your input there, David. Waterproof and integrity. Tell us about it. Okay, there we go. Um, I guess I'll give you a little bit of a history about us because it really conveys the the change in the market and the way our services have evolved. So about five years ago, I was conducting waterproofing installation and, and whatnot. And I really felt like there were a lot of things going wrong in the industry. And I thought, surely there's enough developers and builders out there that are worried about the long-term performance of their 
they're building, that they'd be willing to engage an independent third party um, that's not necessarily trying to do the installation like I was at a time because there's a conflict of interest there. And that we would be that independent third party that would give advice on, okay, that installation's good or that design's good or this should be changed and, and whatnot. And we started out doing exactly that inspection, testing, compliance during cons construction. We then evolved to meet growing industry demand based on that service being well, really well received, as well as changes in regulations around the way that designs were formed on, on certain classes of building here, which anyone in New South Wales would be familiar with. So from that, we uh, expanded our, our skill set, which we already had, but applied it into the new construction design market. So then we're providing waterproofing designs and everything. And now we have grown to a team of probably just over 45, uh, primarily in, in Sydney, but also in uh, Newcastle and Brisbane. We do work in Melbourne and a little bit in other regions as well. So uh, across Australia. And that's really what we do all day every day is just looking at waterproofing design because there's always new considerations uh to be made whether they're changes in standards changing in code of practice best practice whether it's change in ncc regulations like we talked about today or even new materials entering the market providing different strategies on what we can do so that's what we do everywhere from below ground we have a specialist basement team who's on the on the webinar with us today to to above ground material specialists uh and of course then into remedial um for anything that hasn't worked out so well um, and they need our help to to rectify it so that's effectively what we do and we're happy to help with any of your waterproofing needs yeah no that's really good yep and i know we worked together on a number of projects now so well done and thank you for the services thanks for the education you're putting out to in the market i think it's appreciated and just want to make the point that it is it, it is an overwhelming topic sometimes waterproofing and there's specialists out there like uh, waterproof integrity that can lead you through a discussion and when you break it down it's you're probably more simple than you think so i yeah it's good thanks for that and then just just briefly on mark and we australia New Zealand um, project based business and it's actually head office in Napier, New Zealand. Uh, it's coming up 30 years. Um, birthday soon. Now, predominantly we're focused in chemical um, admixtures and spray applied treatments for concrete. And a big part of that is waterproofing admixtures and then um, having our own teams do installation and project management on site to achieve um, a various different range of um, things. But the whole, whole purpose of what we do is adding life to concrete and what that is, is extending service life of concrete structures. Um, so hence why we're partnering with Premcrete to bring in a waterproofing um, membrane system that helps with this upgrade. Now, if you want to just jump slide briefly, I'll just quickly look at this. So yeah, just um, run everything from a design point of view, taking lifting that risk um, liability off um, off yourselves, you know, design and managing that risk right through to on-site training and installation, construction monitoring, um, working alongside um, your teams to get that the right result, and then obviously run the final warranty. So taking a a design through to warranty um, on a project. So that's us in a nutshell, a team of about 70 across New Zealand and Australia and um, working on various projects, retail, health, um, sports, aged care, you know, all commercial construction. So that's us. Um, there's a couple of questions. So thank you for asking your questions. I'll just read them out and then I'll, I'll um, get them to get them answered. Says so, thanks, guys. Just wondering if negative waterproofing can achieve the same outcome as positive waterproofing. Do you want to give us a couple of words on that, David? Yes, uh, I'm not on mute. Okay, great. Can negative achieve the same outcome? Uh, yeah, I think on paper it can. Uh, I am a bit more worried about negative side systems being more susceptible to to faults. 
such as cracking or, or structural movement. If you can just imagine for a moment, a, a lot of negative side membranes are sort of quite, quite rigid in nature. And whereas a, a positive side membrane might be a pre-applied sheet system, which is going to accommodate movement a bit better. So that could be a, a lot longer of the discussion, but uh, yeah, the simple answer is on paper it does, but it has a, a lower fault tolerance. So in reality, I don't think it actually would have as much confidence. Yeah, I think that's fair. Clive, any points on that? Um, I would just add it's um, when considering negative um, waterproofing applications. So inside your basement, it's really key that products are suitably third party certified and tested to withstand the negative water pressure that they're going to be up against. Um, too often we see products that get used in the market that are being fully, fully scrutinized and um, they can only actually achieve a very low level of negative pressure. And they might be applied into a, let's say a two story deep basement um, where there could be at times um, quite a significant head of water up against it. So that's really key. But I would also agree with what David said there. These types of products do tend to be um, cementitious sort of base coatings or or the like. And um, it's always very key when you've got a thin coating going onto a, a concrete surface. We always say to people, even if they're a flexible coating, if there's no crack there when the product is put on and a crack then appears, even if your coating has got 300% elongation, 300% times zero is still zero. Um, so if there's no crack formed in the first place, um, then that, that, that product actually has very little flexibility. However, if there was a small or minor crack um, that a coating was applied over to, then you get the real, you realize the real um, flexibility or the nature of flexibility you might get in the coating. So it's a really key thing just to bear in mind with structures that move as they will do. Yeah, I think that's good. And it's almost, I mean, sometimes we're forced to do it from that way around. But the other thing to remember would be that you're not exactly protecting the structure, like the structure um, within that concrete wall by by putting the putting the um, coating on the inside. So you've got to think about, you know, you're still allowing moisture ingress into that wall um, over time that can take contaminants, chlorides or whatever is in the, in the ground. Um, and potentially have an effect on that structural integrity. So that's a good, good question, though. Um, is there anything else, Brendan, have I missed anything on the chat? I believe that's it at this stage, Hayden, if there's any other good, um, peripheral topics that you wanted to cover off before we wrap up. No, it's good. I'm conscious of time and everyone's got a day job to fill out, but appreciate everyone jumping on to um, continue learning. Any other um, comments, team? Brilliant. Thanks very much for joining us, um, David and Clive. Thanks very much for presenting. Very good overviews. And we will have a recording of this. We'll send out a uh, email for some feedback and please fire us some feedback. We love that. It's how we grow. And uh, yeah, we'll send you some slides and some information as well, but feel free to reach out to these um, or reach out to us and we can point you in the right direction for contacts for um, David and Clive as well. So thank you very much. Have a great day, great evening. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all.